All right. Hello, my name is Brother Elias Guadalupe. I am a Dominican from the Western Dominican province of the Most Holy Name of Jesus outside of, out of uh, California. And I'm here with Dr. Susan Tracy, um, who is the author of this new Ignatius book, The Music of Christendom. Um, and I will be just offering some questions, uh, trying to find out about this book. It just so happens that Dr. Tracy was also my professor and thesis director at Ave Maria University. So hopefully, um, you know, that uh, uh, she won't hold that against me during this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Tracy, you know, I've noticed there's, there's quite a few books out there um, on the history of music. So I want to get a sense of what was your aim in putting this book together? Who's, who, who's your audience? What, why, why this particular kind of book? Okay, Brother Lice, that's a good question. Well, first of all, you're right. There are a lot of music history and music appreciation books out there, which are addressed to a general secular audience. Um, however, in every single case, they all cover Gregorian chant. And that's because Gregorian chant is the foundation of all Western music, which was, we can talk about that question later. But I wanted to... Uh, You've heard the term perhaps cultural Catholic, yeah, which uh, refers to a Catholic who may not be practicing his faith, but but uh, you know he was raised in a Catholic culture. So I think I'm really in favor of uh, introducing the faith to those cultural Catholics, but also to reintroducing Catholic culture to faithful, believing Catholics. Um, I would say that most, uh, in my experience, most Catholics don't really realize how great the contribution of the Catholic Church is to music. And they don't know how important music is to Western civilization. And when we say Western civilization, we really mean Catholic civilization. Now, a number of years ago, Thomas Wood came out with a, a very interesting, well-written book called How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. But there's nothing in the book about the contribution of music. And so that, that I think I want to um, uh, take care of that lacuna there. And, and also, uh, I would like this book uh, to appeal to any Catholic. I think, I hope Catholics can read this and... Um, and discover a whole wonderful field of beautiful music uh, that stems really from the Catholic Church. Now, in my book, I do go beyond. It's not just about sacred music. I do uh, address secular music, but it all comes from the Catholic Church. And in the beginning of the book, I have a quote by John Senior, who was a well-known professor and influ highly influential on a generation of college students in the 1970s who were now bishops, monks, uh, nuns, other you know lay people, and he influenced uh, indirectly such institutions as Wyoming Catholic College. So anyway, he says that everything is starts with the mass. And so that would be in, I have a, I don't give the whole quote in my book, but I have just a little quote about that. And so if we consider that starting out on our musical journey, I think it's helpful. So I hope that any Catholic, and I think that the book is readable by uh, Catholics from maybe high school age up. Uh, I hope, I hope it is. <laughs> and I hope that some homeschool families with high school kids will find it useful so yeah. it's an introduction basically to classical music but within a catholic context and showing the interactions between the music and catholic culture yeah you know i i was just going to point out that one of, the, one of the things about this book is is it's highly accessible i don't think there's a chapter that's longer than eight pages the chapters are mm -hmm. very brief um, it's mm -hmm. something that you can read maybe one or two a night before you go to bed or something like that. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it serves, you mentioned the homeschooling thing. I think it serves as a great almost textbook that you can use. Um, yeah, for right. Because the chapters are just yeah. short enough that um, if you're, you know, you're teaching your kids or even if a, if, if a kid's doing a more uh, independent sort of study, um, you can mm -hmm. definitely use this as, as, a, as a really good resource. That It just right. gives you a very comprehensive and concise um, 
uh, history of 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 music, but from the perspective of, uh, as you said, of the, of the of being a Catholic. Right. Yeah, I wanted to be chronological and cover a wide span, but uh, but I didn't. I couldn't. They didn't have the space yeah. to go into a lot of detail, and so I also was very selective about the musical compositions that I chose to discuss. And you're strictly speaking, of course, it's not a textbook, but you're right. I think it could be used as a textbook in certain uh, settings. So yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so uh, moving on with some of the questions, uh, you know, um, in your book, you called Gregorian chant the foundation of all Western music. Mm -hmm. now, well, well, that, that's, that's a pretty bold claim these days. <laughs> you know? so how do you back that up? Well, first of all, I'm not the only one to make that claim, but so I can back it up in several ways. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned just a little while ago, when you consider that all music history and music appreciation books, if they study or go in historical chronological order, they always have to mention Gregorian chant. And uh, my esteemed colleague and friend, Dr. William Mart of Stanford University, he basically says the same, that it is the foundation of Western music and many other people do as well. So here's the reason. So in Western music, which has its foundation as Christendom, which is the culture that was built up around the growth of the Catholic church. Or think of Ilar Belloc's book, Europe is the faith and the faith is Europe. So we're talking about Western European culture, which is built on the Catholic church. And so the, the music that built the civilization was Gregorian chant because it was the Benedictine monasteries and also the churches that um, music was most mm, well visible and audible, so to speak, uh, because of the celebration of mass and other and the divine office. Uh, and so that's the music that pe most people would have heard. Uh, and and it was written down. So secular music of the Middle Ages mm, was written down a bit later. And of course, it was originally improvised. So we're not ignoring secular music, but we can say that um, sacred music was the basis and the sacred music that was the only sacred music up till about the 10th century was Gregorian chant. And so everything, every, all other music, uh, in the subsequent chapters, I show you how polyphony was started on the basis of Gregorian chant. And then I go further to the present day. Of course, I'm not as explicit in the later chapters, but I really demonstrated in the chapter on polyphony how it's built on Gregorian chant. And so all subsequent developments in Western music have their source in Gregorian chant. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm just going to back up a little bit over here because I, I kind of jumped mm -hmm. ahead of my questions. But, you know, you actually, when you begin the book, you don't actually start with Gregorian chant, which would seem no. to be a, a very, yeah. uh, uh, that, that would seem mm -hmm. to be a reasonable place to start, right? You know, Christian mm -hmm. music, Gregorian chants, old music, you know. No, but you actually start with the Greeks. So right. what, what, what is it that the Greeks can offer us? Why, why these pagan uh, peoples right. from, you know, the, from before Christ? Okay, well, I didn't want to jump right into Gregorian chant because I feel it's valuable to know a little bit about the Greek background. So first of all, um, there actually isn't that much actual Greek music that still exists. Uh, but where we really got a lot from the Greeks would be in... Um, philosophy about music, um, and also uh, the use of musical terminology. So things like interval, harmony, um, all the mode, all those words come from the Greek. And the philosophers had a well-developed idea of music, and they demonstrate how music was held in high it was given a high value so for instance probably the most ancient would be pythagoras and his followers and he considered that musical intervals mirrored the composition of the universe hmm. and it's a little bit of a complex subject but his own um discussion of the actual intervals which for which he uses numbers uh fit today's you know, acoustical division of musical intervals, like 
um, one to eight would be the one versus eight would be the octave, three versus five would be the fifth, and so on. I mean, I said exactly right, but but uh, and then he, of course, he so he thought music was highly important and that the whole world and the universe were arranged according to the musical ratios. And then his idea of the music of the spheres, which we cannot hear uh, because they're so refined. But um, all then uh, Plato discusses that too in the Republic in Tobias. And Aristotle was also interested in music and other Greek philosophers. And there were Greek music theorists. So then if you go step a little farther along and uh, consider the early church fathers, they are the ones who uh, extracted from Greek philosophy, which was pagan, of course, they he extracted all that was most valuable from pagan ph Greek philosophy and what could be brought over into Christianity and what the, you know, the young Christian church um, could learn from the Greeks. So that's basically the idea. And I included a uh, short passage. I'm just looking for it here in the chapter. Um, uh, let's see. I think I might have it in a later chapter. The quotation from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Um, no, I have it in a later chapter, which shows you how long those ideas last. Because in the passage from Act 5 of Merchant of Venice, um, uh, it's Lorenzo refers to, not exactly by name, but he refers to the, uh, the harmony of the spheres. So the concept lasted a long, long time in the Greek ideas about music. So that's basically why I decided to include that chapter. Oh, also right at the very beginning, I have a little excerpt from Ovid's retelling of the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, which is a story about the power of music. Right. So that that also yeah. gives an insight. Yeah, so a lot of these influences are, are are, are very much present. And even, even if we don't see, especially nowadays with, with you know, contemporary culture that tends to reject a lot of stuff from the past in, in, uh -huh. in principle, um, we might not see it, but still all those ideas are still, they're, they're still, they're certainly present in this kind of music. And I think in many ways are even still present today. But yes, I'm, I'm gonna jump ahead a, a okay. little bit. Um, so uh, about 1500 years, <laughs> wow. uh, because, uh, <laughs> You describe in your book, uh, in a particular chapter that I, I really appreciated, um, a society with an increasingly powerful central government, growing hostility okay. to the church, and a sharp decline in Catholic influence in the public forum. And this, mm -hmm. of course, is not our culture today, but the culture of recusant Catholics uh, found in, in post-Reformation England. Right. So um, now, perhaps we're not explicitly persecuted as Catholics in our society, at least in the same yeah. way as those in 16th century England. I, th I think I wouldn't <laughs> it, dare it, make that comparison. White martyrdom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think you can draw some parallels. So tell me a bit about Bird and Talis and what wisdom do you think that they can offer us today? Okay. Well, all right. Well, so Thomas Talis was born in 1505 and died, I believe, in 1585. So he uh, he was a teacher of Bird and his colleague in the Chapel Royal, the musical establishment of the, the kings and queens of England. So Thomas Tallis, on the, his grave, it says he worked under four sovereigns. So he was worked for Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary, Queen Mary I, and Elizabeth I. And so he was very, and it's not, it's pretty certain he was Catholic, but we don't really have any proof. So as far as I could guess, we would say that he was quiet about his Catholic faith. And he, for instance, so he composed um, music in English, simpler music for the Protestant liturgy. In fact, the very well-known and beloved anthem or motet that is sung by a lot of choirs, even Catholic choirs, If You Love Me, that was composed um, for the, you know, the Protestant rite. Um, but then he also composed polyphonic works in Latin that were in incredibly complex and very beautiful. So, uh, so, but he and her, um, since they were colleagues and teacher and student, 
they had a printing printing concern and they got a monopoly from Queen Elizabeth to print all music books. And so one of their first books was um, Canciones Sacre, Sacred Songs. And so in those motets, those Latin motets for four voices or sometimes more than four, sometimes some of the lyrics can be interpreted as referring secretly to the case of the persecuted Catholics. Now, William Byrd, of course, was younger. He was born in about 1540 and died in 1623. So um, he, uh, in 15, around 1590 or 91 or 92, he retired from his position in the Chapel Royal. So he also composed music in English for the use of the Anglican liturgy. Uh, but he left his position, he retired, and he moved out to the country where he composed a lot more music. Well, he actually published music in Latin. It, he was very brave, I would say, because in the early 1600s, he published his volumes, um, the Gradualia, which are motets that use the texts of all of the propers of, of the Latin mass. And it's really ingenious. You can just rearrange them because sometimes they repeat throughout the liturgical year. And so you can just pick, pick those things. He also published his three settings of the mass, mass for three voices, mass for four voices, and mass for five voices. And those were actually published without a cover because he could have gotten in trouble. They were published, published in around 1603, um, which was actually, I think, let's see, the year that Queen Elizabeth died, I think that was the she died. But you know, so King James came in. It was thought at first that he would be sympathetic to Catholics because his mother was Mary Queen of Scots, who was Catholic. But after he came in, he clamped down on the Catholics. So Bird was composing music out in the country for secret celebrations of the Mass. Um, so that's that would basically be his contribution. And one could perhaps draw some parallels and you can see how each man responded differently to the danger and the situation. But um, Joseph Pierce and also uh, Claire Asquith uh, and Father Peter Millward in their books where they discuss the fact that probably, well, I shouldn't say fact, but their theory is that Shakespeare was Catholic. They do say that that he did uh, have the favor of Queen Elizabeth. In spite of her terrible treatment of Catholics, she did, um, uh, she did favor Bird because of course he was so talented and he was in the Chapel Royal, but he and his wife were actually arrested for recusancy um, at some point, but he was never thrown in prison or executed. So that would be, some ideas about how he uh, responded to the yeah. situation. Wow, excellent. So now um, I think a lot of people are gonna approach this book thinking that it's mostly, they're gonna classify it mostly as what's called now classical music. Of course, classical mm -hmm. refers technically to a particular period of music. Now, right. there, are two, there are two senses in which the word classical is. Exactly, used. exactly. So, um, but, um, when people think of classical music, I think there's three composers that will come to mind uh -huh. immediately, and that's Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you you describe you you treat all these composers in your book. You explore all of them, and so how did the Christian faith influence these uh, these composers and their music? Okay, well, first of all, let me say about Bach that although he lived during the period when classical with a capital C music was coming in. He really is considered to be a late Baroque composer. But nevertheless, some of his latest music does have some classical traits. So he was a Lutheran and he was a director of music of all of the churches in the city of Leipzig in Saxony in North uh, Eastern Germany, what we call Germany today, uh, which was the most Protestant area of Germany. So he um, he composed um, cantatas for use in in the Lutheran Church on Sundays. The cantata contained operatic style music, recitatives, arias, and choruses. 
uh, but also uh, in the choruses and it's they're just great uh, great music and so they fit the liturgical calendar which is almost identical to the catholic liturgical cal calendar but it's a genre of music that you would never find in a catholic mass but you could have it in a concert he also one of his most famous compositions is the mass in b minor which is a tremendous work. It's, to, it's so sublime. However, it's extremely long. And so scholars think that Bach composed it uh, as a sort of a, an audition piece. He wanted to get the job uh, in Dresden with the Elector of Saxony, who at that point, even though Saxony was so Protestant because of the succession history, the, the elector at that time was Catholic. So he submitted this work. So for instance, just the first few words of the Gloria in Excelsis Deo uh, et in Terra Pax Ominibus uh, takes 20 minutes. The, the whole Gloria takes much longer. So that's not true. You, that's impossible in, a, in an actual liturgical mess. Okay. Right. So, but, you know, you can see because of the the same liturgical calendar, plus Bach grew up, he taught Latin to the boys in the choir and they sang some music in Latin, uh, but his whole, and his style of music uh, was based on the prevalent style of the Renaissance and Baroque and early classical period, which all stems from Catholic music. Mm -hmm. So so that I think, I hope that gives you yeah. a good, Good idea. Um, okay, so moving now to Mozart. Well, Mozart was Catholic, and um, his father, in fact, worked for the Archbishop of Salzburg. And Mozart, then, as a teen teenager and maybe middle school boy, also played in the orchestra at the cathedral in Salzburg. So they had constant exposure to Catholic liturgical music. And so Mozart, in addition to all his symphonies, and his operas, which of course are secular music. He also composed about 10 settings of the mass, which are known as Misa Brevis, and a bunch of other settings of the full length mass. And then of course, we know about his Requiem mass, which he never, he did not finish. His student, um, Zussmeyer, finished the Requiem mass. And so Mozart, you know, many people have speculated about Mozart's faith. You have Pete Ryder saying everything from Mozart didn't really believe to he was a devout Catholic mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, all kinds of things in between. But it's interesting in his letters mm -hmm. when he went on a tour of Europe with his mother, sadly, she died during the tour and they were in Paris and his Paris Symphony Number no. 21 was premiered. He, in his letters, he writes that after the concert, he went to the park and prayed his rosary to thank God for the favor that he had given Wolfgang. By the way, today is Mozart's birthday, oh, January wow. 7th. And so his full name, I mentioned this in the book, his full name was Johann Chrysostom Wolfgang Amadeus, or Gottlieb in German, mm -hmm. Mozart. And so... Uh, he was given the name of his first two names, of course, are the name of the saint of that liturgical day, St. John Chrysostom. Oh, okay, yeah. Isn't that, course, isn't in, the, that, in the old calendar, it was today, right? Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't know when it is in the new calendar, since yeah. I'm so tied into Mozart and the old calendar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but... So it's interesting. I mean, that's just one idea of how saturated with Catholic culture Europe is, even is today, even it's in its secular state, they still get holidays like the Assumption. You know, yeah. it's a it's a national holiday and right. other. So anyway, that so that's an interesting fact. But Mozart was he did join the Freemasons, mm -hmm. uh, and so you could say that Mozart and his father Leopold. In today's parlance, they might have be considered to be sort of uh, liberal Catholics because they found a way to justify being a free Freemasons. And there was a so-called chapter, a uh, Catholic chapter or Catholic lodge in Vienna hmm. of Freemasons, if you can believe it, even though the Pope had already, even in the 18th century, had condemned Freemasonry. So, so you you know, you just kind of... Uh, you know, but he still practiced his faith, and obviously 
he he did did had a devotional life as well. So that's Mozart. Beethoven. Beethoven's a step further down the secular road. So Beethoven was Catholic. His uh, father and grandfather and himself, he himself had played in the musical establishment of the Archbishop of Bonn in Germany. And um, so Beethoven was very influenced by the French Revolution. And I believe he, that he believed in God, but I don't think he was necessarily particularly devout. And although one of his very best friends was a member of the imperial family, who a younger son, Rudolf, who became arch, um, archbishop. He was Archduke Rudolf, and he he entered the church and became a priest, and then arch and arch then an archbishop. And Mo, and Beethoven composed his uh, Misa Solemnis in D major for the coronation of the. Uh, uh, to Rudolf, and it's another. That's another work which is actually really too, too grand and too vast to be played at an ordinary sung mass or a solemn high mass. The other movements are all very long. Or so that's. I think that's would be what I would say about Beethoven. Okay. Well, we only have a couple minutes left here, so I just want to ask uh, one last question. You know, I, I, as I was preparing for this uh, interview, I, 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 just, I took a look at Billboard's top 100 most popular songs <laughs> today, and I found uh, artists such as Adele, this guy named Kid Leroy, Glass Animals, and Ed Sheeran as all part of this these top hits. Now, I didn't find any Mozart or Beethoven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so right. I have two questions. First, yeah. what do you differentiate this pop style of music with the music you mentioned in your book? Recalling that uh, some of the composers in your book were something oh, of yeah. pop stars of their time, like Mozart and Chopin and this. And then second, what virtues can we garner from looking at the music of Christendom? We only have a couple minutes, but maybe in like three okay. minutes or so, you can try to tackle Well, that. this is a really loaded question, Brother Elias, and I could get in trouble. But first of all, <laughs> I don't believe that Billboard ever has any classical music on its charts, does it? I think it's all for pop music. So Please pop so. music, uh, you know, today's pop music stems from rock and roll, which stems from rhythm and blues. And so the for the Catholic or, and other Christians, we should actually stay away from that. Most people born after, you know, a certain point don't realize that when rock and roll first came in, in the mid 1950s, it was um, highly controversial and many clergy, and educationers, educationists uh, spoke against it because of its highly sensual aspect. And it appealed directly to the lower instincts. And so that's one of the things about it. Secondly, the style, of, and so the, the rhythm um, and various other aspects of the music. We, we don't have enough time really to talk about this. So, but classical music can be ugly at times, uh, and uh, but it's it's uh, more beautiful. Usually, it's of higher artistic merit. It takes it's art music, whereas um, now you know. And, and there is uh, in my book, I do include a little example of folk music uh, in the 14th century, the Libre Fermel, uh, the medieval pilgrim songs. But those are they're almost considered to be art music now, you know. But it's the commercialization of music in the era of rock and roll, the recording of music and music used simply to appeal to our uh, emotions, baser emotions, etc. So, I mean, I'm, I'm giving a very inarticulate and short summary here, but that, right. you know, but we want to, uh, and if we go back and read Plato and Aristotle, I know I have a friend, he's a former colleague from when I taught at Franciscan University, and he went to Thomas Aquinas College, and he said he um, he was a big fan of rock music. But after he studied Plato and Aristotle, he threw away all his rock records and all that music. And so we want to we want to explore and come to know and love the music that is of the highest character. Um, uh, so that's I mean. You know, in this short amount of time, I think that's about all yeah. I can say. No, probably that's, that, 
That's excellent. I mean, this the, this is a thing. I think that when we listen to this kind of music, and even for myself, when I was exposed to class, I was exposed at a relatively young age to classical music. Uh-huh. But really, it was when I was in university that I exposed myself more. And yeah. it is amazing how much that will influence your life. Just, I mean, your passions, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. It all has right. influence. And so I think the Greeks had a good point. Yeah. Well, that's, this concludes our interview today. Um, this book is available on Ignatius.com if you'd like to purchase it or at your local Catholic bookstore. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Tracy, okay. for taking this time. And oh, that's... it was my pleasure, Brother Elias. It was so good to see you again. Yes, me too. Yeah. God bless.